welcome everyone. Uh, this is um, Climate Change Education Solutions Summit 2020. This is the third year of um, our initiative. And the CCS is um, an interdisciplinary initiative of the College of Liberal Arts and Science at Grand Valley State University. My name is Elena Lubimtseva. I will be your webinar host today together with Emily Boetner and um, Eric Nordman in the afternoon. This Climate Change Education Solutions Summit consists of three webinars. So we are going to start right away. And uh, you can also follow uh, the hyperlinks to each part of the webinar on our website, www.gvsu.edu slash CCS. And um, I would like now to pass the screen to Dean Drake. And thank you so much for joining the webinar. Thank you so much, Elena. Uh, as the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, it's my great pleasure to open the second Climate Change Education Solutions Summit. The college is one of the proud sponsors of this event, along with the Regional Math and Science Center, the Geography and Sustainable Planning Department, the GVSU Career Center, and the Office of Sustainable Practices. I would like to begin by recognizing the people of the three fires, the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi peoples on whose land we are gathered. The three fires people are indigenous land, which means that this is their ancestral territory. Every university is built on stolen native land. We are guests on their land. And one way to practice right relations is to develop genuine ways to acknowledge the histories and traditions of the people who originated here first who are still here and who tend to the land always. As we make this land acknowledgement, we know it is but an important first step and that there are many more that we need to take when we decide to engage in the important work of social justice. This year has brought home the critical importance of climate science education. For many years, science has predicted that we would see more and larger wildfires, more and stronger storms, novel viruses, rising water levels, habitat loss, shrinking ice caps, melting permafrost, drought, exacerbation of social inequality, and increased migration. Signs that were once subtle are now quite clear. Now we speak of both mitigation and adaptation. Now we speak of wicked problems that many people with different kinds of expertise are working together to address. We see and must continue to see great innovation and collaboration. Research studies tell us that a person's relationship to nature is often established in childhood and that today's young people are very concerned about environmental justice and sustainability. As educators participating in the Clean Education Solutions Summit today, you are investing in making robust climate change education available to students who care very much about these issues and whose futures depend upon our collective action now. 2020 has asked a great deal of educators who may never have taught online before, much less attended a Zoom conference. As disruptive and tragic as this time has been, it has had the positive effect of requiring us to innovate and adapt, to look again at how we work, travel, and connect with each other, to examine the systems that have shaped our lives, to understand what needs to change to move us forward. You have a wonderful program before you today featuring a group of international experts, including Joss, Joss Jusen from the University of Maastricht in the Netherlands. He's a leader in sustainable development knowledge distribution to primary and secondary students. Chaley Manon, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at St. Joseph U University and a former colleague of ours at GVSU, whose expertise in conservation biology and biodiversity informatics in the context of global change. Ji uh, Guao Chi, Director of the Center for Global Change and Earth Observations at Michigan State University, is leading several large-scale research efforts to assess the impacts of climate change and human activities on ecosystem services, including carbon sequestration, food production, and water resources. And there were several exciting panel discussions as well. Um, and remarks will be offered by George Hartwell, former mayor of Grand Rapids and a champion of climate adaptation and sustainability. Welcome. May your discussions be rigorous and inspiring. Well, thank you, uh, Dean Drake, for that nice introduction. And um, 
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, uh, educators. Uh, you have made a conscious decision to give a day to participating in this important conference on climate change, teaching in an age of climate change. With, with everything going on around us today, and, and especially with teaching in the time of pandemic, I am wholly supportive uh, of you, wholly in sympathy with you, and you can you can spell holy either way you wish, because I, I support you wholeheartedly uh, in your efforts uh, to teach in these times. And I, I'm also aware that the work that you do is holy work, shaping young people for an, an uncertain world, uh, instilling hope in, in times of despair and, and loving them for all the potential that they represent. I have a daughter and a son-in-law who are employed in the Grand Rapids Public Schools. Uh, our daughter as a social worker and our son-in-law as a principal in one of the city high schools. Um, and so I hear firsthand the difficulties of instruction in a time of COVID. Uh, and I want you to know that you have my deepest respect for the work that, that you do. I'd like to thank Dr. Uh, Elena Lubemstva for her dedication to putting on this, this conference. I, I know for a fact that uh, planning for this conference began as soon as the last one finished a year ago. Uh, and she has once again put together a, 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 an outstanding panel of speakers uh, to present to you today. Um, Elena's passion for teaching, her, her depth of knowledge in climate change, and her uh, global uh, colleague network will become uh, ever more evident to you as, as the day goes on. Uh, I am least among those you're going to hear from today, but I am deeply grateful for the uh, opportunity to be um, included on the agenda to open this conference and to introduce your first speaker. Uh, beginning in 2004 and concluding at the end of uh, 2015, it was my great honor to serve as the mayor of Grand Rapids. Um, I suspected going into that time as mayor that I was likely to be uh, um, made more difficult uh, as the result of economic circumstances facing Michigan. And, and I was not disappointed. <laughs> you may recall the years 2001 through 2011 that represented a decadal recession uh, in the state of Michigan. While, while other states emerged from recession in 2004 only to dip back in uh, during the foreclosure crisis in 2008, Michigan never even emerged, uh, but we stayed stuck in the economic swamp for 10 full years. Um, and so I, I knew that if I was going to have a positive impact uh, as the elected leader of this city, um, I needed to instill hope in our future. Uh, I needed to assure people that that the decisions that we were making, that the programs we were implementing, that the services that we were uh, improving would be, would be focused on a vision for Grand Rapids that was both hopeful uh, and progressive. It seemed to me that the, that the vision I held before our people needed to be tightly bound to uh, environmental sustainability. Um, and so, Right after I was elected, I assembled a team of 30 local environmental experts uh, from education, nonprofit, business, and government to uh, help me develop and implement uh, an environmental agenda. It seemed to me that the um, vision absolutely had to be about environmental sustainability. And then while I was still um, a baby mayor uh, in uh, June of 2004, I was invited to join 19 other uh, mayors uh, for three days at Sundance, Utah, uh, to begin developing a strategy for cities to address uh, and confront uh, global warming. Uh, I knew uh, very little about the subject, but the 
Uh, it hadn't yet, I suppose, uh, uh, surfaced on my radar, uh, along with those important issues like collecting the trash and, and filling the potholes. But the conference was underwritten by the U.S. Conference of Mayors and the Robert Redford Institute. And so off I went for a fun-filled three days in a beautiful part of the world uh, with uh, 19 other cool mayors. I was soon to learn that those three days would quite literally change my life, redefine my understanding of, of leadership, um, and uh, send me in a direction of scholarship and activism that I had not previously known. Uh, joining us at that conference was, was Vice President Al Gore. Um, just a little more than two years after his defeat at the hands of the U.S. Supreme Court in his bid for the presidency. Um, Al Gore had immersed himself in the science of uh, climate change, global warming, as we called it, uh, as we referred to it at that time. And, and he put together uh, what he called a, a little slideshow. Um, we watched the show. Uh, we spent hours talking with the vice president, with uh, Robert Redford, uh, and with the scientists that the conference had uh, convened to help educate us over these three days. We, we walked the trails around uh, Sundance in uh, twos and threes, and, and we talked earnestly about what we were learning and what difference it was going to make when we went home to our cities. Uh, to a person, I can tell you, this group of 20 mayors left that conference inspired, clear-eyed, and convinced that we were the advance guard to protect the planet. Of course, the, the little slideshow became the basis for the film uh, An Inconvenient Truth. Uh, Vice President Gore um, went on to receive the Nobel Peace Prize and a generation of climate deniers arose to challenge us climate evangelists. Now at this, at the same moment in time, um, the manufacturing sector uh, in America and all over the world had begun employing principles of, of sustainability uh, into, their, into their management practices. Um, it's not enough to produce a strong economic bottom line, uh, they concluded, if, you're, if your production practices are despoiling the environment uh, uh, that, that, and, and destroying natural resources, uh, or if your employment practices are, are, are harming your workforce. Um, and so what emerged from that time was the concept of a triple bottom line, people, planet, profits, uh, or if you prefer a different alliteration, uh, uh, equity, environment, and economy. Uh, I, I introduced this concept in City Hall, Grand Rapids, and we began planning for a, uh, for a sustainable governmental entity. Front and center in all this work was climate change. Uh, we were focused on um, remediation of, uh, of damage to the global climate uh, that was affecting us here in West Michigan. We were also though developing and implementing strategies uh, to adapt to the change that was already devastating the globe and devastating our city. So we set goals for renewable energy. We met them and we set new higher goals. Uh, we took a, a clunky old bus system and we created a world-class transit organization. We went from zero to 100, that is zero lanes of dedicated bicycle facility to 100 miles of bicycle facility in Grand Rapids over five years. We separated storm and, and sanitary sewer systems and we made investment uh, against the damages that flooding of the Grand River created. Uh, we invested in energy efficiency and we helped to launch an initiative uh, that would to achieve zero carbon emissions by 2030 in 1 million square feet of downtown office and institutional buildings. We took a tree inventory of the entire city 
and we set the goal of increasing our tree canopy by several million trees over 20 years. And we did this in, in the midst of the deepest recession that Michigan has seen since the Great Depression. So why do I tell you all this? Uh, I, I, I can assure you I'm, I'm beyond bragging. Um, I learned early into retirement that the shelf life of old mayors is very, very brief. And plus my successor, uh, Mayor Bliss, has gone well beyond the point where, where I left off, uh, carrying forward her own powerful vision of a sustainable city. So no, there, there really are two reasons that I take your time this morning to tell the story of Grand Rapids' journey into sustainable development. First, first, and 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 I know I'm talking, I'm talking to an audience of uh, real trained educators. So, cut me a little slack here. First, I understood that my role as mayor was that of educator. Sure, I had to hold a vision before the community that was a compelling vision. And, and, and sure, I had to have at least a, a general understanding of a pathway to achieving that mission. And, and sure, I had to rally my staff and, and community leaders around that vision and around that pathway. But at the same time, I, I knew that what I was proposing would not be universally understood or accept it. What do you mean, Mayor? With all that stuff about renewable energy and tree planting, we elected you to pick up the trash and to make sure the drinking water is safe and to fix the dang roads. And so I knew I had to be really good at trash and water and roads, but we also had to teach a community what it means to be stewards of nature. We had to uh, instill an ethic of environmental responsibility in, in, in a people. In short, I had to educate. And there's a second reason that I, that I told you that story about Grand Rapids' trajectory uh, for sustainability. I felt that as a mayor in a time of economic distress, I had a responsibility to lead my city from a place of hopefulness. People were hurting, they were frightened, they were despairing. My job was to console, to encourage, and to challenge our community to be more than we were, to be better. And, and isn't that exactly where you are today? Educators, you need to help raise a generation of smart, thoughtful, disciplined, innovative, young people equipped to take on challenges that even you and I have not imagined. The stakes are high, the, th the threats we know and the threats that we, that we don't know. We need to draw on resources deep within ourselves. You need to be continuous learners if you're to equip your students for the world that they will enter as adults. But even more than equipping them with knowledge, you need to give them a hopeful vision. Now I can only extrapolate from my experience as, as a mayor, and I, I didn't have to deal with a global pandemic that saps the, the will and the, and the spirit of our, of our children and adults. But your job as educators includes stirring the hearts of young men and women to imagine a better world and to begin the work of living into that world. Holy work, that's what I said at the beginning. You're doing holy work. You're mending broken spirits. You're shaping powerful visions. You're, you're loving and you're encouraging and you're challenging and you're supporting. It is not hyperbole to say that the world depends on you. One of the proud moments in my time as mayor came when the United Nations, <clears throat> excuse me, 
when the United Nations recognized our sustainability work and, and designated Grand Rapids as the first U.S. city to be a regional center for expertise on education for sustainable development, RCEs as we were called. For the first two years or so of this designation, I had no idea what to do with the honor other than to um, trot it out and wave it around uh, when I did my public speaking. But then with, with Norman Christopher, the Director of Sustainability at Grand Valley State University, I attended a conference of, uh, in, in Kirkcaldy uh, in the Netherlands of cities with this same RCE designation from all over the globe. And there I met Josh Yusen, whose RCE was, was hosting the uh, gathering. The first thing that struck me about the conference was that there was a fair amount of navel gazing taking place. The first thing that struck me about Josh Yusen was that his gaze was fixed firmly on the future and his passion was for getting sustainability done, embedding it in the life of his city and, and cities all over the world. You can imagine that the naval gazers were not too fond of Joss. You might also imagine that I instantly loved this guy. Joss and I became friends and, and co-conspirators. Uh, he remains for me today, one of the very bright lights in a sometimes dark world, an evangelist for education, for sustainable development, a prophet projecting a, a hopeful, sustainable future. Joss came out of the private sector where he led global companies uh, as CFO, he gave up the lucre of uh, private industry to lead a non-governmental organization, the Rhine Muse RCE. He is also affiliated with Maastricht University as a lecturer and as a PhD candidate in education for sustainable development. Josh will be speaking to you today uh, based on his uh, doctoral thesis which is to be published in 2021. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome my hero, Josh Yusuf. George, actually, thanks is not enough. I just said I uh, felt the urge of stepping outside in the fresh Dutch rain at the moment. But it's not raining, otherwise I would have done that to cool down again. You inspired me, and for the rest of this discussion, I will take the audience to the debate after my presentation. So thanks a lot. You gave energy to the RC Ryan Moos, and uh, I couldn't do no more and no less than trying to give that back to the community. Most people, I guess, are in the States, so a little upfront warning. I might say things or express things or make suggestions that don't fit your culture. That would be exactly my idea. So I'm not going to lecture you climate change this uh, this morning, this late sunny afternoon actually in the Netherlands. I'm going to try to add some energy, some critical thinking, some perspectives where it comes to education for sustainable development and then especially climate change. Well, for, let me hope you guys are not suffering from too much PTCCSS at the moment. Actually, my students appear to do so. So some pre-traumatic climate change stress syndrome is around here in the Netherlands. While we feel very liberated and free and honest and can say everything, still our students are found to be very, very depressed these days, as if climate change is going to destroy their worlds even more than COVID is going to. I think it is not. First, let me, let me put the perspective right from across the ocean, you are connected with a little yellow dot here on this side of the big pool called the Netherlands. We are 17 million and following Bangladesh, the most densely populated, densely populated country in the world, which we're not very proud of. But OK, it sets the stage for sustainable development because the map I'm showing you right now, that's the whole of the Netherlands. And you can put that in Michigan, I think. It, perhaps it will take a little bit of squeezing, but that's all we are. So we're more sea. Than anything else and indeed we have the cows 
We have the potatoes, on for, most unfortunately, which we turn into French fries. We are a fun-loving, uh, uh, yeah, bunch of people. I have to admit that we have a meaning about absolutely everything. So there are 17 million specialists in soccer and 17 million specialists in COVID-19. Uh, you can imagine we live in simple houses, densely packed together. If we weren't excellent managers of water, the countryside would look a bit like this. So the only reason I'm sitting here talking high and dry to you is that we are excellent engineers, became excellent engineers, to protect ourselves from water. This densely packed country had to learn, had to educate. We had to utilize our soil most effectively. We had to develop high intensive agriculture. And we had to learn to live pretty close together. You know, you can't walk here for one mile without meeting fellow countrymen. That's different, I think, in the States. We have this strange polar model which dominates our politics and doesn't mean more or less than we talk endlessly with, with one another about everything which concerns us, which appeared to work previous decades. Doesn't work in the COVID-19 period. Um, so we had to, we were forced to develop as a very precious commodity. We define knowledge as the only thing we have. We don't have oil, we waste a lot of coal, we're drenched with water and we're very tiny. So knowledge is all we have. And of course, we are the best soccer players in the world. We party a lot and we welcome you most warmly to our tiny country. But if we don't do what I just said, that this would actually be the picture. This would be our lives about 40 meters beneath the surface. That's where the, the, about 60, 65% of a country actually lives today. So talking about threat of climate change, we came to the right place. This is real. This is where I am in the south of the, uh, the country, near Aachen, near Belgium. Yeah? You look on the hillsides, no danger yet. The only concern is biodiversity. So what am I going to talk about today? I'll try to give you some catchy or delusive opening remarks. I'm going to present that climate change is not there, but here. Your place, our place, it's everywhere. I'm not going to tire you with formulas and physics and difficult things because Elena told me there are students listening in. So no crap today, just the highlights you can easily remember. From there, I will go to future relevant learning. Get away a little bit from this negative threat, this black atmosphere of climate change, but look, like George said, towards the future. From there, we will talk about learning, education, and then redefine schooling or finish schooling. Perhaps we should we just just stop with it and learn again. I will get through that. From there, we will readdress climate change. My perspective on what we might do or should do together. I think we should learn to create a local to global learning space, like George also very gently underlined. We are one people. Whether you have elections or not, and whether who will win or not, is actually totally and completely irrelevant. This world is one. And no fool in the White House can change that. And no president or government in the Netherlands will change that. We are one people, and we have one climate, and we have one chance to keep living here. And of course, the time limit, 30, 40 minutes, and you'll be due to a fresh coffee, as I will be. Now, climate change is here. That's, that's obvious. So I'm not going to preach for that. But we also have overpopulation. We in Bangladesh know all about that. But downtown New York and in the suburbs of Chicago, they know what we're talking about. That's a serious problem. We have right extremism, left extremism, we have holy wars. We have perhaps conservatism. We have globalization to face. We have a gap in development opportunities. We have this rich, poor, underdeveloped developed gap. We have very sick posts on Facebook. And we have SARS, COVID, and virus 24, because I don't think we should get into the, the illusion that solving COVID or Corona, as we call it here, will be the end of the song. This will happen again and again and again. So the challenge is magnificent and interrelated. It's not just climate change. One thing influences the other, one thing causes the other. And we have young people unfamiliar with Pink Floyd. That is just a personal remark I'm very concerned about. But all in all, we are confronted with a one world, all together down the drain problem overnight. So there is only one way forward to address this. 
is all of us getting away and making enough room for young people to deal with this world. And especially nothing, we know all about it already. I will show you some examples of that. This is, uh, this is not me, just, just a guy looking like me who made great movies. And he said one thing when he, uh, he did, for example, Twin Peaks, he's American, he's a fellow countryman of yours. He said, well, the problem we are facing today is not physics, is not politics, is that our Im imagination is failing. We, we, we don't dream anymore. We, we dream not, not enough anymore. So this looking beyond the one thing that humans can, compared to animals or lower developed species, is looking ahead, dreaming, seeing things that are not yet there and make them reality. When I talk to my students about climate change, I can picture some nasty, nasty pictures, black and white. But I take, for example, this, this thing in Houston, the misery you had with Hurricane Harvey in 2017. And they say, oh, it rained a lot. It rains a lot in Holland, too. Oh, gosh, because those poor Americans. Then I tell them, well, guys, that's 110 days of Niagara Falls that came upon their heads. And, and then students start to wake up and sit upright and say, wow, that's not a formula. That's a much, much water. When I look at the world, yes, if, if we look at the jet stream, how it changes, yeah, just give you a few impressions about what's happening to England when you see the immense power of nature. Yeah? I will shut the, the, sh the sound down, sorry for that. If, if you see the immense power of nature, it's not about a tiny discussion that we have locally. It's not about a tiny piece of diversity. It's about a huge system changing at the moment. So I think we are misjudging many things, many values with our lack of imagination. You know, today we are talking, we're talking a lot about biodiversity, how important it is to save the polar bear and the panda. And of course, these are cuddly creatures. Yeah? I love them. Right? I have them in all versions upstairs with my kids when they were younger. But actually, biodiversity is about no more strawberries in my backyard. Biodiversity is about the same kind of fish in Lake Michigan, and most of which we can't eat anymore. So if we want to make clear what rain is, for the example of Houston with the, with the Niagara Falls, I try to explain to students that they simply can't have any coffee tomorrow, or cotton fields won't grow anymore, they can't buy any clothes. So biodiversity is in the veins of our planet. It's not thing actually has only very little to do with a polar bear or a panda. Let me get take you to the basics. We, I think everybody knows this picture. Any student, any teacher can talk about this for half an hour. And we, we know how the system works. The vaporization from the, from the oceans, how clouds exist, uh, uh, come into place, how the sun heats up our earth, how the albino effect radiates back warm. Actually, we all know this. But when testing this simple picture with over 400 teachers in secondary, they didn't come up with 15 minutes of stories. And that I was flabbergasted about. I asked them about biodiversity, about the different soils we have, about the height of our mountains, how cold it was up in the air, the different kinds of trees we have, how microorganisms influence warming up of the land and the decay of plant life. So we were pretty shocked, concluding that many, many in education, most unfortunately, came to copy-paste what politics and science were telling them. No longer relearning or rethinking what it might be about. Just a few examples. You know, this is the very basic picture of high and low pressure areas, how they come into being, the, the big windmills we, uh, the atmosphere creates. We are a very big machinery. We are in a weather machine. It's not about my backyard. It's about living in a system that we most stupidly have influenced, and I think most accidentally. But we are influencing a mechanism, a machinery such large, with so much energy and so much pressure, we can't just sit on political tables. We can't agree that this will change. We are messing up a global system, Gaia itself. That 
I think we should realize, I don't want to sound threatening about this, but we should have more knowledge and more realization about what's going on. You know, everybody heard about the currents under the sea, but that those currents of hot water and cool water, of salty water and not saltine water, influence our daily lives, our climate, our agriculture, the way we have to build houses, the way we can live and can't live anymore, that is, seems to be hardly clear, we found. So if we now have to conclude that we already are messing up with this immense machinery, it is very strange we still dream or present ourselves romantic pictures. Of course, this is beautiful. This is a color reef. This is, this is a wonderful disturbance. But this is real life. We are the ones ourselves that are creating this change. And I still see many students walk the streets on Friday, marches for the future. And I say, hey, guys, it's you. It's your T-shirt. It's your cup of coffee. It was Nikes you're wearing that's creating this. And all of us are doing this yeah, with good hearts or from stupidity or ignorance or deliberate. But we are doing this. We are literally eating our world. What is COVID doing to us, we are doing to the world. Yeah? Well, let me say we're a virus, but, but stand still and realize that climate change has nothing to do with politics, neither Trump nor Biden. It has to do with us, with the immensity of us messing with an immense system. And we can be very lucky. We have 70, 75 percent of oceans on this world that as far as it goes, appears to take up all the mess, take up all the yeah waste we put in our air. You know, for 50 percent of seas are coping with the problem. And the more acid that seas get, the better they do the job. That's awkward, of course. But there will be a moment when our seas are sour enough, are satisfied with taking up all these gases. At that moment, we will see a very rapid, very quick change. When that will happen, we really don't know. I'll show you some formulas later, but I'll give you the conclusion now. We just don't know. For example, the ocean, there will be life, there will be plant life dwelling even much better as the ocean gets more acid, as there is more CO2 in the water. Other plants will not. How this equilibrium functions, whether it's a big plus or big minus, we, 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 will, we can estimate, we can believe and tell ourselves that it will be a minus, I believe so too, but we still don't have this in our fingertips. We don't know. We can see the big system of CO2 circling around, but did we ever truly realize what would happen if indeed the permafrost in the northern Russia atmosphere would melt in the soil, I mean? We saw these first pictures coming in. I think over, over this summer, most people, you know, got the picture of, of wood fires in Siberia. What follows next is it has left the news here in the Netherlands already weeks after. So after the bushfires, eight weeks, there is complete silence of what's going on. And then we know, we found also as scientists, there is an immense amount of CO2 still captured on our rocks. So what we see today, what we are doing as humans, the pollution of the air, what the sea can take up from a natural cause of affairs, is only a very, very tiny part already invoking change. This tiny part will unleash and change the larger machinery. That's what's going on. So to be quite honest, of all the CO2 we give to the air, we know that only 50%, about half, remains. The rest is taken up by either the ocean or disappears somewhere in our land system or in our living ecosystem. And let me be honest, we don't know exactly where, how, for how long, and how that works. So the teaching about climate change and all the physics is very interesting and very much true. I think the students will be delighted when I would talk for hours about the greenhouse effect, the N-layer model, like we're putting on extra layers of clothes and jackets. And they will be thrilled to, 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 to work on wind, which is very relevant to 
to learn to understand the heat of a body and radiation. So is the Boltzmann equation. But from the student and learning perspective, I sit beside the student and I think, Jesus, are we beating up ourselves with perhaps too much exact knowing? Well, we don't know exactly. So we leave an immense space for politics to intervene, to discuss. I think we should go ahead and talk about behavior, about consumption, about production. This is all very important and very relevant. We should stop the beating because this will make nobody very happy. This is a student now, born new. What we do know is that some of us, China, US, Europe, very much so Netherlands, is spoiling our climate. That we do know. We do know the emissions cause a warming of one degree. We do know it is created by humans, most probably for most likely half of it. I would advise never to wage that, that discussion anymore. Whether Mother Earth is accelerating the problem or not is actually not the issue. We should change our behavior and start thinking this very afternoon, if we haven't got to start thinking about it, how to rebehave and rethink. Waiting for the next political or scientific conference, people will bring us nothing too little. We are still climbing that hill, we're still blindfolded. A nice example for me is always the scenario emissions we have, you know, you should realize we even have scenario emissions that lead to a cooling. Sounds idiotic those days, and I hope Trump isn't watching, but these are all balanced scenarios. They are all realistic. They're not fantasy. So on average, we are going up, most likely. But there is so much discussion about it. So I would plea to go back to the basics and realize that we indeed are warming up and the planet will keep warming up for decades to come because of the misery already created. It has to lose warmth and for losing this warmth and extra energy, it has to heat up. Sounds contradictive, but that's the way physics work. So we can also look at a more positive side. What about our woods? We also see increased growth, faster growth because of the carbon dioxide. So this machinery, this green machinery, is still there to support us. But we honestly don't know how much, in what speed, and for how long our forests will do this. This sounds miserable, but we don't know so many things. So one would almost say, so we actually know about it. And somebody told us that we do not know. But we do know, in general, what's going wrong. And that's my plea. In general, we know we're heating up. If we as citizens, and if the next generations following us now, however, are tend to believe that we can control this, that we can have new agreements, frameworks, conventions, protocols, and then everything will be okay again one day. No, I cannot follow that policy. I am not a big believer in Paris. The one thing that came out was this, was this greed occur, we have to do something, check. We already knew that since 72, since the flood of Rome. We've wasted 50 years so far, ladies and gentlemen. And we're still not sure about what we're doing. So all this conference, and with all due respect for the people doing their very, very best, yeah, trying to get us together, I think we're on, the, we're on the wrong track. This is not what it should be about. If I take you back to 72, most of you should know that in 72, the Club of Rome already exactly predicted what was going wrong. This is 50 years ago. This is two generations we let go by. So we were most proud in 87 when our common future and Brundtland said, oh, job, gee, we have to do something. That's 15 years later. Just to give you, take you further on this perspective, it took even 13 years to get the Millennium Development Goals on the table, which said, amongst others, there should be no poverty. Now, of course, there should be no poverty. There should be no inequality. We knew that 1870, after we start colonizing the rest of the world. 
And then we did it again in 2015. We came up with the sustainable development goals, which are wonderful, again, but that don't differ that very much from the limits of growth in 72. So what will happen next year? Next year, all the educators, all the schools, all the governments, and all the mayors, George, will again be presented plans of what to do next. I'm very much afraid for that moment, even more than for the heating of the world itself, I have to admit. It deludes us. So my plea is to learn, to educate, and to rethink ourselves. Because schemes like this are wonderful from a system perspective, the way we organize our world, what we do. You know, what we do is we send kids to school till they're 18, they either sack or fail or are great or magnificent. And they go to university or go to work and then we have a system of work and we buy a house and have a cab and a car and kids and then when we're 60 we have to go home again because we take a pension. We are very much used to living in these boxes. And through this system now we try to, <laughs> to recuperate, to heal this magnificent machinery of the planet we're living on. So that makes me think makes me angry sometimes. I think, how dare we walk away from the problem? Because we're still walking away. Given wonderful exceptions, in total, we're walking away. We already knew that solar energy can save us. If we replace every square meter of city with solar cells, we're there. We have all the energy we need. We still use 16% of hydro hydroelectric energy. Wonderful. We can't step that up. We know about that. It will lead to conflict, it will lead to devastation of nature. It's still there. We have this illusion of biomass energy, which is very low in efficiency, and which sounds very stupid because we have to tell these young learners and this next generation, hey, we did a great thing, we burned the woods because we are future. This is really, you know, think about that twice. We still have nuclear energy. So shoot me, but let's mention it. It's still there, still one sixth of our total energy supply. When you play your game for 60 minutes, the same evening, 10 minutes will be done through nuclear energy. It can be against it or not, still there. We have to rediscuss that. And of course, I'm going now to the positive side of life. There are so many things we can do already. We can use the sun, we can use the wind, of course. We can even capture CO2 before it escapes the factory. We can bury the CO2 back where it came from restart the coal mines like we can do in our region. We have tons of mileage under there, tunnels where we can bring it back into. But nobody wants to build his house on top of it. But okay. But the technical solutions are there. This is typically American style, you know, build a big wall in Arizona and take out the carbon dioxide from the air. Belgian scientists almost a year ago created solar cells that create hydrogen, that produce hydrogen. This is a fantastic dream. So we have an illusion, we have a problem, we have an illusion, and we have solutions. The simple trick is to get those together. So I'm often asked, what can we as a government do? A lot of things. But the first thing a government should realize, in my opinion, next to all the law and legislation and programs and financing and impulses governments can, can initiate, they can hand, at the end of the day, we are the government. We all are. So even waiting for a governmental decision is, well, question mark. So it doesn't need to get, we don't need to walk this pathway. There's no, there's no drama. There is no, there is urgency, but there is no doom scenario for pictures like this. Things will change, you know, Grand Rapids High will change in 24. Right? We will act different, talk different, consume different. I hope. Things will change. Yes, a university professor will have more holidays on brighter beaches. You know, every teacher will drive a hydrogen car. The world will look better. Yeah? Mayors will pick children in a wood. The well deserved tension. So the world is still there and the opportunities are still there. The first thing we should do is forget about the complexity of sustainable development. When we address this, speakers that often go before me and in colleges and in, in conference hall, they know they are grave for misery. They say, oh, this is, oh, this is so difficult. People 
sustainability is no rocket science, you know, it's not putting a man on the, on Mars or healing an elderly people, a person. It's not that difficult. We made it extremely difficult previous 20, 30 years. For example, the people planet profit mantra. You know? We talk and question and try to reason through people planet profit. Just give me an idea. You know, I'll be hashtag for that for this. I know that. But realize that people planet profit is actually a very strange thing to to talk about because because people and profit is us you know is ourselves it's, so this equilibrium between two the three dimensions is at its very least strange yeah? and if you ever seen Earth at a conference table you know we have a great conference today but Earth is is not there actually that perhaps many youngsters are representing this heart for planet Earth. But it's not there. It has no speaking time today. So that made me wonder, yeah, where are we? Is this really an equilibrium we can, we can discuss, people, planet, profit? Because it's actually people talking to people about what other people should do. That's people, planet, profit. And it appears we only have to be concerned when we as people overlap with planet. Or for crying out loud, no, we are inside that planet. So. Earth is still on the table. As you Americans say, you're either at the menu or on the table. Earth is still on the table at this very moment. And the only song I could find was a great, great singer, Neil Young, who asked himself who's going to stand up and be the Earth. We're still not taking that serious. So People, Planet, Profit is presented as three dimensions, very, very neatly organized. Well, sustainability is real life. It's something like this. Everything is multicolored, interconnected. Everything has to do with everything. And people, that is just life. That is not complex. This is life itself. So sustainability should not be something for researchers, policy developers, and the like. Should not be be be, be brought together in black and white reports nobody reads. Sustainability should should be internalized. We should accept that we are very strange, very, very complexly interconnected beings messing up with Earth. That's all. So it sounds, again, difficult, but give you some, some straightforward examples. We are shipping T-shirts through India coming from Bangladesh in large container ships because I want to pay three euro ten and not four euro seventy. That's what we're doing. Yeah, we are shipping HP computers from 47 different countries because I think I am believe to make believe I was made believe that I need this new laptop. Yeah. So we are consuming with high speeds. We lose 10,000 of these boxes every year. Don't even dive them up anymore. Yeah. We, we we know we have a strange strange cultural thing like fashion. You know. Wouldn't it be very, very obvious to s stop doing this? You know, fashion is the illusion you have to buy new clothes because somebody says you're not looking sharp anymore. Consider that what it what it really means. What what, what we are dealing with. You know, sometimes I'm, I'm going to be even harsher on you. For for parts, COVID appears to be a blessing. You know, clothing industry dropped forty percent. So one of my first responses was great. Wow, cheap. Less containers, less workers in these dirty Bangladesh factories. And we can change this container shipping, and we can change this fashion industry, and we can change consuming sugar, and we can change eating meat within the next three minutes. We can just say we don't do that anymore. You don't need policy. You don't even need learning. Even when, I, when I'm in college, I always use two cups of coffee, you know? And students come up and say, oh, you're not sustainable. You, you, you are using two different cups of coffee. He said, but that's home brewing coffee, you know, 70 cents a cup. You will pay more than three euros this same evening at Starbucks. And then later when you go shopping, you can't buy a homemade shirt. So you order one through the Internet, through Amazon, or Bangladesh. Now, who's not sustainable? We with my cheap coffee beans in two cups? Or your T-shirt? 380s and spending budget on things that make you feel great but are actually devastating for our planet. Rethink, relearn. So how then can we relearn? 
I had a very simple statement. Everybody always says, oh, youth has the future. That sounds great. I think youth has no future. Absolutely not. Youth is the future. Everybody 40 plus, whether an engineer, architect, politician, or educator, should realize that. They are the future. We cannot talk about them or do something. They are already, which gives them a unique opportunity. Because instead of thinking we don't know what the future brings, we don't know what the future wants, we can wrap them by the shoulders, look them in the eyes and say, Jesus, how, how, how can we make up to you? Yeah? They are the future. This is a basic rethinking, because if they are the future, we can only, we can, we can limit ourselves to very simple actions as 40 plus, you know, get them on their way. Forget about people, planet, profit. Agree with young people and tell them about it. Try to explain that ecology and planet is all we got. I love Musk from flying to Mars. It will be great. 20 or 200 people will be living there. For the next 500 years, guys, the, mo the, the multitude of us this, will be stuck on this earth. Right? We will be here in 500 years or not. I choose we are. So we have to understand everything about this planet we're living on. It is an illusion that we can dream of welfare and expensive coffee and new t-shirts and new games without this crowded planet being in balance where it comes to well-being. So the only possible growth we can imagine is when we have taken care of ecology the best way we can, of, a, of well-being the best way possible, the most social way possible, and then we should still accept that some of us have this large boat, these expensive clothes, and are more richer than the rest. That last part is not very well accepted in the community of sustainable development thinkers. I know that. But we have to accept if we comply with Earth, if we learn to live together, there will always be people more lucky, working a little bit harder, being a little bit more talented, and they will be richer and they will consume more than others. So, uh, going on with that idea of the new of dimensions of sustainability, we can easily figure out what to study, what to learn. We have to learn about biodiversity, about food, about healthcare, about energy, about construction. It's very simple. Then why don't we allow young people to learn together about these things? Why mathematics? Why primary school? Why high school? Why examinations? Why telling young people you don't suffice, you're not good enough? What nonsense. They are the future. The only thing we can do is offer them a, a, a way of continuous development towards that future, which is already theirs. So if they learn about food and water energy, etc., in a, from a holistic perspective, it's the best we can do. So now we build these wonderful kinds of systems with all kinds of schools and examinations and rules and administrators and politicians swarming around it and consultants and experts. I say, no, 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 let's, let's cross that, you know? We, we can cross that. We, we can learn future relevance from an integrated perspective and still comply with curricula. So nobody has to be shocked when I'm saying this. You still comply with curricula and examination demands and it will hurt nobody, but allow these youngsters to build and learn for their future. We are now in this system, very questionable, you know, got the schools here, uh, street level, We've got the politics, policy development, we all know about that. We've got these layers of thought in between, NGOs, consultants, programs, gurus, you know, deep learning system thinking, blah, blah, blah. Schools are still down there, you know, street level, happy, happy to get the schools warm. we got all these priorities coming up, STEM, entrepreneurship, culture, languages, ICT, and then also climate change. That is a big mistake. We should not put climate change or sustainable development on the list of the things we need to do. Education for sustainable development is education. For what else should we educate were it not for these dimensions of human development? This is interconnected. What we have today in our education system is, is politics, is money, is, is coalitions, is people fighting for the pieces. Kids won't get better from that. Yeah? It is even it became extremely difficult to follow who was telling what about what and who was pleading for what. 
So we are still in this old machinery, despite everything we said as of 15 years ago, you know, schools being, uh, creating creativity, etc. We still didn't change. We still believe that we can add to a system not working anymore. I think at the basic, we should go for an active learning attitude of our kids. To allow them to question everything, including ourselves. Question everything, guys. Yeah? Do that problem-based. Not only the nice things, also the nice things, but, but do it problem-based. Make it relevant. Learn about food, care for the elderly, water. Do that in your community again, and you can create this ongoing learning line. The previous 15 years, we tried this in 18 countries. Can this be done? Can we create these ongoing learning lines? We named them Flight for Knowledge. Can we connect these learning lines within the school, with elderly, with swimming, can, can we, with parents? So can we interconnect this learning, root it back into community? We, we developed for 700,000 years, guys, because we are communities of social beings. Only since 100 years, we try to stuck away our future in buildings. I think we can still rebase ourselves and do that not only in, in, in Grand Rapids and not only in Maastricht, but do that as world citizens, permanently connected. I will not go into many details, just, just highlight a bit what I, what I consider with these ongoing learning lines. If we learn about wind energy, for example, or food or water or anything, we have to we have to reassemble what we uh, what is broken now. Uh, you, we, we, we let the learning fall to the ground by all. So we should be had a challenge. Uh, we created the illusion that math and language and sustainability and environmental education are completely different disciplines. This is entirely nonsense. Uh, this whole scattered piece of things we deem important is actually basically one thing. You cannot do or learn or use one without the other. We as humans are continuously interconnected, observing, thinking, reflecting, shouting, screaming, weeping, laughing. But at school and our education system, there are still people that say, oh, today I teach climate change. This is impossible without talking about culture, peace, food, and the planet. And youngsters are these interconnected, sometimes wonderfully crazy, driven, absurd associated beings they're not in the system yet they still have this multifaceted talent of making us go berserk as teachers i love that that's what we need to use we need to go back to our brain cells associate coordinate so the design maps of knowledge about everything young people need to know and do that together with industry together with science, with parents, with elderly, with the bakery on the street, with the big chemical firms. If we feed these knowledge schemes together as an open educational resource, we tested and tried that they will comply with every curriculum worldwide. You can take every examination you want. On average, we came to a curriculum coverage of 17 times. So learning about food, water, energy, the earth, is a multiplication of curriculum learning through an, in a natural process. Of course, teachers will look flabbergasted. And this was the first result, first hour we ever tried this. The man got berserk. Yeah? Kids came up with 70 questions about war in the first minutes. Yeah? This was all, also a teacher who turned around to class and said, guys, I'm sorry, but I, I really don't know. I, you know, guys, I don't know. And that was a very elusive, strong moment. Yeah. After that, the school almost got torn its roof off. Kids started inviting people, taking parents to school, inviting friends from other schools, inviting youngsters from university. We had DJs playing at school. We had the prime minister visit us. Yeah. So only because we said, hey, guys, you're not just pupils, you're students. That's a huge difference. It's your future. And the only thing we do is get everything supplied so you can learn and you can test so no different stem you know when you when you when you're learning about water or purification or little creatures living there test it do it make everything work weld build construct go out there search live so no environmental education with all due respect for bunches of other colleagues Environmental education is something that is there all day long. 
no whole school approach of putting solar cells on the top of a school's roof, or crying out loud. Get out there with the river, stand in the mud, catch fish with, with your hands. What well, next thing we try is can small kids teach each other? Can youngsters transfer knowledge also through the web, of course, and further enhance and create it? They can. We have hundreds present for experts, for parents, for mayors, to show their solutions, their research. It was their interviews that went to the city. It was their proud parents that came to school from a totally different pers perspective today. We forgot about citizenship lessons, about language lessons, about history lessons, because the students themselves integrated all these matters and disciplines. And it gave pride. They were so proud, they could, in 18 countries where we tested, there was not one refusal of industry not wanting to cooperate. So not one company said, we don't care. Not one company asked money to access the factories, to access knowledge. So from there, we saw that youngsters, and there is a great example in the States, New York based, it's called Nifty. Youngsters from the age of eight, 10 on already, have this entrepreneurial quality to still see things that are not yet there and get them created. Perhaps it's play, perhaps it's playing the drum, but this is a unique quality, this entrepreneurship, that we are switching out of them while they run through the educational system. And a separate entrepreneurship course will not solve that problem. So you can build on youngsters' energy, unleash them from school surroundings, let them go out there. We tested it, it works, can be done. It's not difficult, the world is open and there for you. So if we do that, if we have young people going out, the Dutch government said, well, just you, you sound stupid half of the time, but perhaps the other half, it makes sense because then you connect the world of work with the world of education. You connect it multiculturally. You don't discuss languages anymore because you have Dutch students learn with the German students and they have to either speak English or German. Nobody wants to speak Dutch. So in a very natural way, students came forth with new business cases, sometimes about old business, sometimes about very sustainable business. Some were very small, some were immensely large and, 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 and wonderful. But all these cases incorporated the entire curriculum of economics and organizational knowledge. So even before the age of 14, we had students incorporating university accounting principles. And that made our eyes more and more bright. Just like for understanding the flow of a river on the land side, students in primary needed Pythagoras, of course, because this river is not square. They just needed Pythagoras to understand the flow. The problem was the teacher at primary who thought, oh, gee, Pythagoras, this, this, is, this is going beyond. But it's not the children that are the limiting factor, nor is the curriculum the limiting factor, because they can take care of the curriculum easy now. So we had this immense tryout in more countries and came out quite satisfied, quite convinced eh, that, that the world itself can be the student's learning ground. If so, then there is absolutely no need to educate climate change or sustainable development. I think this, I hope you're still with me. Because when you study the world and you see that's going down the drain, you will act from understanding. There is also absolutely no need to design programs or projects yeah, that have our youngsters connect with the poor third world. They will do that by themselves. They will connect with India, with Ghana. They will co connect with poor villages in Peru. We've seen that happening. We did over 400 virtual conferences. Two of them we also did with Grand Rapids, actually, in the, uh, very early on already. But we saw children discussing cultures or beliefs or unsustainable development. It makes a huge difference between me talking about that T-shirt you shouldn't buy and kids getting in touch with Bangladesh and see what's going on there. That makes all the difference. That brings understanding. What you need to, to get this done is shiny, happy teachers. We need wonderful, smiling, well-paid teachers with a company car, the best of laptops and free food. Not exaggerating. Teachers, whether in primary or university, excluding me, need the best treatment possible. 
like George said, it is, and I truly believe that, an almost holy profession. If you are allowed, if you are trusted by society, imagine, to work with the future. You're not teaching curriculum, you're not taking exams, you're not, you're not harassing kids for 50 minutes. Eh? You are teaching the future. So that, that, that's quite special. So we can go away and, and take, take a distance from teachers as 50 minutes maniacs, you know? as outsourcers, as people that need consultants and need explanations about system change and more you know, these kind of strange things. I think teachers can be a student's indeed best friend. Well, not best, but at least a good friend in learning. A kind of homo universalis, homo universalis, that can go out in the world again and be honest. But teachers created this concept I'm talking about now. This is not just use and incorporate the idea. This is, this is made by teachers. They tested it. They celebrated together. So primary, secondary, further, for good order, together. No segregation. Neither in belief, culture, nor nationality. Just co-constructing what learning and education can be. So this way, I'm going to speed up a little, a little bit. I'm going to skip some slides now. I think the point is, is cool. If we can create a learning community of teachers, and you are bold enough or, yeah, let me say black and white enough to also tell teachers if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. That belongs to the game, guys. 10%, 20% just can't handle what I'm talking about now. I even met teachers who refuse to speak English or German. It's idiotic. Teachers that refuse to understand Pythagoras again yeah? or, or, or the CO2 system. Well, then get out. It's typically better, perhaps, to say, but yes, I, I should give you that advice. Also within the teacher community, we should further professionalize. Then you get happy, shiny teachers that can do this. Then you have teachers that are welcomed in industry, can stick their nose in every part of new knowledge, yeah? that are welcomed by Google and Microsoft to learn about holographic steering of machinery. Yeah? This is fascinating, and all this is possible in a most friendly, constructive attitude. On the other side today, we have still people telling us that this way of thinking then should be completely liberated. I don't agree. Talking about teachers, we still find instruction is immensely important. Students will not celebrate learning all day long. It is very sensible to just tell them what Pythagoras is, to tell them about carbon dioxide, to tell them the world is a sphere. Just give blunt info and data. Seems very appropriate, still works. Yeah. Then to put it black and white, do that in the morning, give youngsters freedom of learning in the afternoon. Let them go out in the community and study these things. So reposition education, put the charts and pieces together again, do that in communities, do that local, regional, do that on state level, do that on US level and connect from the world with the world from there. And all this is a merger of efforts from industry, science, government, and schools, and parents. So it is not a whole school approach. You will very soon see that UNESCO will come forth with a whole school approach as a huge solution. They didn't understand what I'm talking about. This learning we saw working and we still foresee is a community-based, well-wrought, completely integrated, student-driven learning. It is not a new educational system. Mind you, it doesn't even take school to do this. So a whole school approach that will perhaps tell you also from the US government, put solar cells on your roof, as, I, as far as I'm concerned, no, take a seat in an old factory, go sit beside the river, and you can have an excellent school. Challenging a bit. What I think American communities are better in, better equipped for than communities in Europe and in Asia, is this community-driven approach. You got more feeling for that, more experience, already more practice in getting youngsters out in the community of making, re-establishing establishing these connections. So I think the U.S. and Grand Rapids especially, finishing uh, Elena, should be, become a partner in a local to global learning sphere. For with that, I, I bring you one warning, you know. What we did actually is, as I said, was born from the street, you know, from welfare, youth care, even the 
the guys preventing drug abuse. This is really born from society. We used very old wisdom and high profile new insights on learning. And we did that for a few years. In 2007, this whole concept was ready, was, was coming out of the oven. So we tried it between 2008, 2017. As a bottom up initiative, and George also reminded that, we were not very welcome. Eventually, all these big organizations told us, well, okay, we, we can't avoid the conclusion anymore. <laughs> this is good. This, this has it. But then still today, in schools listening in, I hope you won't be offended, you will still be approached by solitary STEM projects, by deep learning. I have no idea what deep learning is. So really, I see it as a copy-paste, uh, unsuccessful. Be aware, this is not what you need. And you will not need those larger new programs coming up. I saw you, I saw the, uh, showed you the earlier picture of the immense delay of five decades in human development. My warmest advice and hope and wish would be don't accept that. Be a teacher, be a school, break down your walls and have those students learn and live in society again. Don't wait for any commandments that will show you the conservative way which turns backwards. Can't be more explicit also for the debate that will undoubtedly follow up I spoke these words. So I see a future ahead which is very simple and can be concluded in a few, very few words. Let every child learn anytime, any place, with anybody, through any device of those themes that define our common future. That's all we need. And there is nothing, nothing that surrounds us which can block or prevent this. From a research perspective, as, as reminded, I formulated it a little bit more extravagant. It comes down to the same. How can we get together again and have these youngsters learn? That's my view on the world. So to the lessons of the past and the promise of the future, anybody who says the guy is berserk or perhaps very nice can send me an email. You're most welcome. The pedagogical concept and all we achieved so far with thousands of people together, guys, has only been possible because people were critical, yeah? because people reached out. And I warmly welcome the community now listening in to just reach out and get this done together and create this more sustainable world that we all already know about, that we all can envision, and that belongs to the kids. So there isn't a more beautiful mission I can imagine. Thank you very much, Elena. Thanks, Pete. Thank you.